All right, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Brian Haas, I'm here from the, the Broad Institute, and I'm gonna teach this morning's module on uh, gene fusion discovery in cancer. And uh, just to mention up front that um, the person who usually teaches this lecture is, is Andrew McPherson. He's done it at least uh, once or twice in the past. And, um, and I'm, this is the first time I'm doing it here, so I apologize ahead in advance if it's a little rough. Um, and I'm actually borrowing a lot of slides from Andrew, and I've just basically injected a lot of my own material into it. So give Andrew credit where credit is due. Uh, here's, here's our contact information for Andrew. Here's my contact information. So we have a few learning objectives uh, on fusions. We want to be able to explore the impact of gene fusions in cancer. We want to learn about the different types of evidence for gene fusions, understand uh, the available detection methods and the different tools that are available for bioinformatics tools. And um, it's a kind of a, it's a, it's a messy problem, right? It's, uh, it's challenging. You can end up with uh, finding important cancer fusions, but you can also have lots of artifacts. And that's one of the big challenges in the field is dealing with all the false positives. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And you want to be able to assess uh, a gene fusion's uh, potential function, like how, how might it be contributing to tumor genesis. First, we'll define what a gene fusion is. A gene fusion is uh, a fusion between two genes. How do you get it? Uh, oftentimes, what will happen is uh, you'll have uh, a, a translocation between uh, two chromosomes. This is, this is an example of a balanced translocation, uh, where you can think of it as like a recombination event, but it's a recombination event that's not supposed to happen. Or, um, and it's not necessarily a recombination that happens, but some fracturing happens within the genome and the repair system. Uh, it doesn't do a perfect job when it tries to put things back together again, and you can end up with these kinds of translocations. Um, in this case, you've got a chromosome 9. This is, a, actually, this is the most famous fusion. This is the bcr able fusion uh, that you find in chronic myelogenous leukemia. About 95% of patients have this uh, particular chromosomal aberration. And um, it involves a translocation between chromosome 9 and chromosome 2, uh, which, which puts uh, the ABLE gene and the BCR gene uh, right next to each other and um, creates a fusion event, creates a whole new chromosome. It's called the Philadelphia chromosome. They actually give it a name. Um, and you end up, so you guys end up with these two different chromosomes. 9 ends up being a little bit bigger than it was before, and 22 ends up being this, uh, this chimera um, with this bcr uh, fusion gene. So these are the kinds of things that happen. Again, this, is a, this would be a, a balanced rearrangement, uh, but not all, all fusions are due to these kinds of rearrangements. Uh, there, why are these important to us? Because uh, these kinds of events uh, they are really highly relevant to cancer biology. In many cases, these fusion genes generate fusion transcripts, and which may or may not generate fusion proteins. And um, in any case, uh, these, these fusions can, can drive cancer, right? They can actually be drivers of cancer. Uh, like I said before, bcr able one is, uh, is the most famous case, and again, 95% of cases. Uh, but the nice thing about this is that this is one that, that can actually be treated, okay? Because it actually creates a, a new kind of kinase, and we'll talk about this. It creates a fusion kinase that's basically unregulated, but you can actually treat it with a drug, which is a, a kinase inhibitor, right? And it can be highly effective. Um, you find fusions in, um, in both uh, liquid tumors, these are leukemias, as well as some solid tumors. They're probably better well known for, for, uh, for liquid tumors like leukemias, uh, but you do, you do find them in, in some solid tumors as well. And in some cases, they can actually be the like, signature driving element of that particular cancer type. All right? So it's like the hallmark of that cancer type, um, such as the bcr case with uh, CML. In prostate cancer, about 50% of prostate cancers, you find a temporous 2 erg fusion. Um, this would be in the category of, sort of, of the solid tumors. Uh, you find um, another uh, kinase fusion, EML4 kinase, and uh, non-small cell lung carcinoma. There's only 4% of the cases. Uh, but this is relevant because you know, for the 4% of patients that have this uh, diagnostic feature, you can actually try to treat it with, uh, with kinase inhibitors. Uh, so it can improve, uh, there's evidence that it can improve the patient outcome. Uh, there's another uh, tumor, which actually, this is kind of a, a rare, 
It's a rare cancer, this uh, fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma. It's difficult to say, uh, but 100% of these of uh, these tumors are driven by by this fusion. Uh, and there are some others too that we'll talk about that are really it's like this one fusion is, is the defining hallmark for that cancer. Uh, and then in uh, certain uh, brain cancer, glioblastoma patients, 8.3% of them, you have this FGFR3, TAC3. Uh, so, so it's important to be able to identify these because then you know what kind of cancer you're dealing with, right? Because not all cancers are the same. You might have a cancer type and, and uh, like a brain cancer, and depending upon what's essentially driving that brain cancer, it's going to lead to different treatment options. And also um, the prognostics are important too. Like how, you know, what's your expected survival if you have... These, these different kinds of events that are driving the cancer because some cancers, you know, they can be, uh, uh, you know, they're more dangerous to have than, than other, other cancers. And a lot of times it's just, it's going to depend on whatever the event is that's sort of driving that, that, that tumor. So what is the evidence that these, uh, these gene fusions are initiating cancer? Uh, well, for one, they, they correlate with the cancer phenotype. Uh, we know that uh, you can you can successfully treat some of these, all right? Like the, the kinase inhibitors and uh, CML can treat the uh, or even um, a lung adenocarcinoma. Um, you know, the fusion involves a kinase, treat with kinase inhibitors, and oftentimes that, that can can improve the outcome. Um, you can take that gene fusion and you can uh, you can put it in a in a cell and inject that cell into a mouse and see if it develops into a tumor. Um, so that's more proof that the fusion is, is playing a role in driving that tumor. And we can also, um, there's experiments where you can try to just silence, if you know that fusion exists, you can try to silence it with um, you know, microRNAs, short hairpin RNAs, uh, or other techniques. And, um, and you can show you can, you can drive down cellular proliferation. All right, so there's good experimental evidence that, that these things are, um, are the driving events. And we'll see some examples of that as well as we go forward. So how, you know, what's the molecular mechanism that's involved and in how a, a fusion can, can drive cancer? It's really just, just like with mutations in cancer, and you guys already learned about you know, somatic mutations and some of the other things that are um, you know, responsible for, uh, uh, for, for driving cancer. Two really two key elements here. You're, in some cases, you're activating a tumor oncogene, uh, or the other option is you're deactivating a, a tumor suppressor. Right? Either of these paths um, separately or together can um, can drive the phenotype. So our fusion is going to do that. Oh, that is my little buddy, uh, Tim Towdy. Anyone know what Tim Towdy is? Any uh, old school Perl programmers? <laughs> and you don't know? No. I thought you were raising your hand. You're like, yeah, I know what it is. No. No. No, you're just stretching. All right. Anyone know? Somebody knows. No. All right. There's, there's more than one way to do it. <laughs> All right, so that's that's what this is. More than one way to do it, and this is just like if, if you're if you're an old Perl scripter like I am, uh, this is sort of like the uh, the acronym of uh, of, of uh, Perl programmers. So uh, this is no one really uses Perl anymore. Everyone's switching to Python now. I figured I'd try to you know inform everyone about this and carry the the Perl legacy forward. So and it just it just seems like something this guy would say, right? Yeah. So. All right, so we've got some examples of uh, all the different ways in which you can accomplish those goals, knocking out tumor suppressors or activating oncogenes. Um, this is just one of, of a, a bunch of examples. We'll start with the most famous one, the BCR able. Here we have, um, we have the BCR gene, and uh, we have the able gene. And what's important here is that the able gene encodes a, a tyrosine kinase. This thing is really kind of crapping out. Um, no worry, you can do this. Or can I? Yes, I can. Uh, so we have tyrosine kinase in this uh, able gene, and this um, you can see these these little arrows here point to where breakage points occur when you find these fusions. So you can see it's not just one place where you might find uh, a break point in the DNA. Uh, there's several locations, and over here you find there's a few different locations that uh, typically light up. Uh, when you create a fusion between these two genes, you end up with this, which is the the fusion product. And uh, what this actually does is it creates a, a fusion protein, which has the end terminus of the BCR protein with the um, basically the kinase region of the, the able protein. And what this does is it, it, it deregulates the kinase. You actually end up with this, uh, this fusion protein that has kinase activity, but it lacks the regulatory components in it. 
All right, so it's just constitutively active. And what is it doing? It's, it's driving cellular proliferation. All right, so that's how, that's how this one works, generating this, this uh, fusion protein. In the case of, um, of temporis erg, right, which I, I mentioned earlier that about 50% of prostate cancers have this particular fusion. It involves uh, temporis and, uh, and an ETS family transcription factor coming together. Uh, most of them are the, are the temperous ERG. This is the 50% of them have this temperous 2 ERG fusion. Uh, another about 4%, I think, uh, have the ETV1 fused onto it. Uh, but they belong to the same family, the ETS family of transcription factors. I and mean, you find there's a lot of fusions out there that the ETS family of transcription factors are actually pretty promiscuous when it comes to the fusing with other things um, in, in, um, in, in different cancers. So they'll show up uh, quite often in different kinds of fusions. <laughs> So what this does is, um, so we can see here, this one's kind of interesting because you have the, the way this is drawn is you have the, the coding region shown in the darker color and the, the non-coding region. So these are the, the untranslated regions, the untranslated exons, five prime UTR, three prime UTR, and here on ETV1 we have the five prime UTR and three prime UTR. So what happens here is that the first exon, which actually it's a non-coding exon, of Tempris 2 comes together uh, to form this, uh, this fusion transcript uh, with the ETV1, or in this case, ERG. Uh, so you get most of the coding regions for the transcription factors, right? But the 5' prime UTR is basically different. And what's also different here, the, the, actually the, the, the key part of this, is that the, the promoter of uh, Tempris 2 um, you know, is, is right upstream. So now you basically have this fusion transcript being driven by a different promoter, or right? it's being driven by the Tempris 2 promoter. And Tempris 2 is this, uh, it's highly expressed in prostate. So now what you end up having is this, um, this transcription factor, which has basically lost its original regulation, and now it's just being driven at like full throttle by the Tempris 2 promoter. All right, and then that's, uh, that drives the cellular proliferation. So no fusion protein here, it's just uh, you know, most, of the, most of the regular protein. In this case, you only have half the protein because um, the, the fusion event occurs right here. Uh, but you have enough of it where you have the DNA binding domain and you know it's going to go and it's going to do its thing um, at full speed. Another uh, interesting example is uh, the IGH MIC fusion that you find in uh, Burkitt's lymphoma. It's another one of those signature fusions. And uh, here you have uh, the MIC transcription factor and here you have the IGH, which is the immunoglobulin heavy chain. And, um, and the fusion event here is basically um, going to be, it's, it's, it's kind of similar here. You end up with um, putting the, at least part of the MIC transcription factor under uh, different regulatory controls. All right, so you have now the, you know, whatever enhancers or promoters are actually driving the IGH, they're now going to be driving uh, MIC. So there's really not much of a fusion protein here, if any. Uh, it's mostly just um, it's mostly just a regulatory thing, and um, and you find there's there's a huge diversity of these things. You know, find fragments of genes inserting into the um, the IGH region, and um, and it's it's bad news. You end up uh, inducing expression. Uh, there's another one. This this one is is actually really interesting. Uh, so this, this is a case where you have um, you have a MIB transcription factor uh, with uh, an NFib transcription factor. So these are both transcription factors. And you can see how the, the fusion event occurs here. Um, you're basically getting the full MIB protein, you're getting the full 5' prime end, you know, all the promoter information, everything. Like this is all intact up here, all upstream. Uh, but you're basically you're missing just a, a tiny little bit here at the 3' prime end of the coding region. Um, and you're basically missing almost all of the NFib uh, protein. You capture just a very, very little tail piece of this. And you end up with a fusion protein, but it's, it's basically just the, it's the MIB protein, because you're only getting this, this tiny little bit at the end here. But the key part here is, is, uh, is, is really the regulation, because this, this MIB transcription factor, the 3' prime UTR, uh, has microRNA binding sites. All right, so you actually have microRNAs that are involved in, in post-transcriptionally uh, down-regulating uh, MIB expression, okay? And when you make this fusion, what are you doing? You're losing the whole three prime end here, right? So you're losing the, MI, the microRNA binding motif. 
Um, and that's that's really the key thing here. So, and they do a little experiment here where if you have, you think of this as being like the wild type, well, it's not wild type, it actually has MIB and, and multiple copies. Uh, but then you have, um, here you just have the fusion. If you transfect this with microRNA oligos, uh, what you'll see is that there's a, a decrease in expression of, um, of the MIB. Uh, but in the case of the fusion, because it's actually, it's lost that regulatory region of that transcript, you really don't see much of an effect at all. So MIB responds, the fusion does not. Another example, I only have a few more of these, but I, mean, I, could, I could do like two hours of just going through all the examples because I think it's, it's interesting, but uh, just a couple more. Uh, so there's, uh, there's LAC-B2, NCoA2, fusion, it's in colorectal cancer, and um, in this case, you have, um, uh, let's see, okay, NCoA2 is a transcriptional activator, and um, I'm trying to remember how this one works. The, um, this is actually, this is actually a, a tumor suppressor in this case. So NCoA2 is a, is a tumor suppressor. Uh, LACB2 is an endonuclease, but it's, it's not really critical what, what this is doing. The key thing here is that the fusion actually disrupts this uh, tumor suppressor. And, um, and because it's disrupting a tumor suppressor, it's basically then sort of activating you know, the cell, cell proliferation. And um, you have evidence for that here, where if you, ex if you enforce expression of the tumor suppressor, and you can, this is a measure of, of cellular proliferation, and you can see that there's a significant decrease in, um, in the in amount of cellular proliferation. All right, it's basically just trying to restore NCoA2 functionality. So, so I guess it's, it's just a nice example of, uh, you know, you're not making a fusion protein, you are making a fusion transcript, but fusion transcript doesn't really, doesn't seem to be doing much biologically. The key thing here is that you have a tumor suppressor that's being knocked out by the result of the, the fusion event. Uh, it's another another interesting one because uh, it actually involves uh, a few different mechanisms. Uh, this is uh, involves uh, MIB transcription factor, and then uh, the QKI. It's an RNA processing gene, and you can see the uh, the fusion event that ha oops I'm getting a little ahead. The fusion event that happens here. You basically get the end terminus of MIB, and you get the very three prime end of QKI. Mm -hmm. Um, mostly just knocking out QKI, uh, but here you have here you have um, H3K27 acetylation peaks. All right, so this is a, a transcriptional activation mark, uh, epigenetic mark. And what happens here is that because of this fusion event, it's basically bringing this um, this activation mark, this epigenetic activation mark, uh, to the MIB transcription factor. And, and this is one of the ways in which it's actually going to start activating the, the, the fusion transcript. All right, so it's really it's the epigenetics here that's playing a key role. Uh, having this enhancer here is now going to turn on um, MIB when it would normally not be on. And this actually makes a, a functional fusion protein. And um, what makes this worse is that this, this protein has an autoregulatory feedback loop on the MIB promoter. All right, so now the, so the, the acetylation is now turning this on. It's making the protein. The protein's going back and turning it on even more, right? And QKI, it turns out to be, uh, it's in the category of tumor suppressor. So you end up knocking this out too. So it's a combination of these three different things that really um, are thought to, to play a role here in the disease. Uh, EWS, FLI1, and Ewing sarcoma. Um, here you have uh, RNA binding protein, which is a, it's also a transcriptional activator. And we have um, another ETS family transcription factor, FLI1. There's a, there's a huge family of these transcription factors. And again, they, they, they seem to show up time, time and time again in these different fusions. Here you make a functional fusion protein. And, um, and you can see this here in this little uh, illustration here. This is the fusion protein. It, it binds DNA through a DNA binding domain in the, the uh, transcription factor, the FLI transcription factor. You have the transcriptional activation domain of the EWS. All right, so this is going to just basically help drive transcription at places where the transcription factor would normally bind. All right, and what is this going to do? It, it actually upregulates uh, 
aurora kinase, cyclin D1, and these are involved in, um, in the cell cycle. Um, so this is a uh, bit turning on the cell cycle, and it's going to start uh, proliferation. Uh, I think this is the last one. Um, this is another really important one. This is another one of those signature fusions that, you know, if you have this, it basically means you have this cancer. Uh, everyone that has this cancer is found with this fusion, uh, to my knowledge. This, this involves, uh, and this is, this, is, this is really interesting too because it it's, uh, has a very different strategy for how the, you know, the underlying biology and how the, the fusion actually drives cancer. Uh, so here you have SS18, uh, which is a subunit of the SWI SNF, the SWISNF chromatin remodeling complex. And you have the, um, the SSX gene, which is a transcription factor. And this makes a functional fusion protein as well. Okay, so you get this fusion, fusion protein here that combines different domains. And what happens here is that this SS18 is, is actually part of this chromatin remodeling complex, the SWI, the SWI sniff, um, or SWI sniff uh, chromatin remodeling complex. Um, it's now anchored to the SSX transcription factor. So what it's doing, okay, so it's, it's going to, the SSX transcription factor is now going to recruit this complex, the chromatin remodeling complex, to the genome at sites where it would normally bind, or right? And there are certain regions in the genome that are, are rep repressed by um, uh, epigenetics involving uh, the, the polycomb rep repressive complex, right? So the, the, it's basically uh, heterochromatin. It's really tightly wound up DNA. And you had polycomb comb, uh, complex that's all involved in, in trying to keep it all nice and compact. Uh, well, this is recruiting now in the SWI sniff complex to regions of hetero normal heterochromatin. It's basically helping to unwind it and open it up. And what's that going to do? It activates it for being transcriptionally active. Um, and so that's, and that, because it's, it's, it's opening up areas that actually have a lot of um, developmental regulatory genes, uh, it's then activating parts of the genome that aren't normally activated, and that's driving cellular proliferation and causing cancer. And this is a pretty serious one. So this one's really all about the chromatin uh, remodeling and, and uh, changing the, the epigenetic uh, structures. So there are a few different uh, mechanisms, you know, basically just taking all these examples and, and looking at, you know, the different the strategies that, that you have uh, for fusions to drive. And basically you're targeting every aspect of, of biology you can think of as far as like the central dogma of biology. Um, at the protein level, we're, we're interfering with cell signaling cascades. A lot of times this happens through, through kinases. Uh, at the RNA level, we have transcriptional activation, right, with trans different transcription factors. Lots of these things have different transcription factors that are, are bound in there, and that's just how they're, they're operating. Uh, Post-transcriptional regulation, right, by removing um, microRNA binding sites from the RNA. Um, and then, of course, at the DNA level, we're looking at things like chromatin remodeling, um, you know, repositioning of enhancers, um, changing the epigenetic marks. Tintaudi, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, so you have different uh, different signatures of these events in the genome. Um, you have chimeric DNA sequences that are formed as a result of, of fusing fusing different regions of the genome together. A lot of times these produce fusion transcripts, right? So you can detect it as being a chimeric mRNA sequence or you know a fusion transcript sequence. Uh, you can also there there are other uh, hallmarks or um, effects that you can detect, like expression changes, right? Genes that aren't normally expressed in a certain cancer type, you might find them as being very highly expressed or expressed in, as, a, as an outlier, uh, and that, that would be a, a good hint that there's something going on, and that hint it could be hinting at maybe a fusion having happened and that being involved in driving the, the transcription. There are different discovery platforms that have been used for, um, for observing the fusion events. Some of the earliest ones just involved, you know, seeing strange-looking chromosomes under the microscope. All right, you have uh, what's called a karyotype, where you basically can take um, the, the highly compact chromosome structures, um, and uh, you basically just just you know see them under the microscope. You can stain them with different staining. This is this is called G banding. Um, you think that would, the G banding would involve. Um, having bands that like GC rich sequences, but it's actually the other way around. It's actually the AT rich regions that are actually dark bands when uh, you do G, G staining, G banding. 
So it's just an example of a carrier type. You, know, you can just see the chromosomes under the microscope, and you can see uh, at positions where you have arrows here, you know, there's, there's uh, clearly something going on. Um, here's a big you know, chromosome uh, with a, a smaller one next to it. And you can, you can look at the banding patterns. You can try to see, okay, it looks like this piece of this chromosome ended up on this chromosome. And a lot of times, you know, these are the events that really led to, um, you know, these are the initiating events that led to cancer. So these are the kinds of things you can look for. There's, uh, there's other approaches. I mean, it's kind of hard to, if you have like a very well-trained eye, right, to see these banding patterns and figure out which chromosome is which. Um, there's other techniques. You can do sort of a, a chromosome painting strategy or spectral karyotyping. Uh, where you basically have um, have markers that have different fluorophores attached to them, and you know these markers correspond to different chromosomes, and so you can effectively just light up the chromosomes according to these these different markers. And I think it's a lot easier to look at this, and you can see, okay, here's a big yellow with an orange, right? That's that's clearly different, or white with the gray. It's a lot easier to, see, to look at it this way than than uh, looking at the banding patterns. So this, I guess, are just the more you know, more modern ways of trying to do these things. Um, you, instead of looking at entire chromosomes, you might have, have specific events that you want to be able to study. Uh, for example, the, you know, our favorite the, with the BCR able, you can, you can have a marker that has a fluorophore attached to it, like a green one in this case, green for BCR and the red for able one. Um, and it's basically just, just that region of that gene that you're, you're looking at. And you can do um, fish, um, which is a, a fluorescence in C2 hybridization. And basically just hybridize that marker to the chromosome and then you can look um, you know, under a fluorescence microscope, you can look and see you know, where, where are these regions of the chromosomes and uh, you see cases where you know, they're lighting up together in the same place where they shouldn't really be, uh, they should really be in separate places uh, and that would be you know, evidence that you actually have a, a fusion gene. So it's another nice um, a diagnostic kind of way of looking at these things. Expression arrays uh, have been used, uh, basically not even just expression arrays, I mean, just expression in general has been used to, to hint at you know, what, what's, you know, what could be the, the driving event in cancer. So some earlier studies, uh, this is back in the 2005, um, just would look at cancer, compare cancer to normal, and say, okay, what are the genes that are, are expression outliers? All right, and those genes that are expression outliers, maybe you know, they're the ones that are, are really driving the, the phenotype. Uh, and in this case, so they, they developed this, this method called COPA. It's cancer outlier profile analysis. And you can think of this as I have like a, a little bit differently, but the way to think of it is, is has to do with like standard distributions or normal dis normal distributions or Gaussian distributions. And you have Z scores, all right? And you basically just, you have your normal. And you think of this as being just like a, 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 the expression, you think of it as like a, a normal plot sort of flipped over on its, on its side. All right, so here you have normal prostate and these are the, you know, zero is basically the center of the distribution. And, uh, and you're looking at the expression level for uh, specific genes, in this case ETV1 and in this case ERG. And in the normal case, you basically have, you know, sort of a normal distribution. Um, you yeah, know, most cases are going to be centered around the mean, which in this case is going to be zero because it's been standardized. But you want to look for outliers, all right? Uh, if we look at uh, prostate cancer, you know, you have, you know, there's a lot of uh, expression Profiles that basically fall in similar ranges to the. Um, I should just get out my own pointer. Um, similar regions to, or similar uh, intensities to the normal, right? The distributions aren't that different. But then you have these outliers here, right? So if you think of these, like, what kind of Z scores would these guys have, right? They'd be they'd be high and they'd probably be significant, all right? So this is what it's really looking for: is you know, do you find do you find these expression outliers? Um, in this case, in ETV1, you find some expression outliers, and uh, ERG is another one that showed up as having um, you know, more expression outliers than, um, than most other genes. So these came up as, as being two candidates for maybe, maybe they have something to do with the underlying uh, prostate cancer biology. And um, another thing is, is uh, you know, do you see these um, in the same patients, or do you see them in different... Question. Oh, it's a question? Okay. Yes, yeah, so, I'm sorry, they're different samples. So these are different patients. All right, so, so here you have you know, patient one, patient two, patient three. So these are all different patients. And they're basically just, uh, just ranked according to their, um, the, the expression intensity. 
that's been centered at the mean. So zero here is actually the mean. They're all mean centered expression values. So again, just, just think of this as like, this is like a, if I could just if I could draw something on here, I would. Uh, you think of this as being like a normal distribution, or, and that's the mean of the distribution, and you have like crazy outliers up here. Um, so that, that's all that, that's doing. And um, yeah, so another thing is, is you could ask, you know, if you have these expression outliers, you're seeing the, the same outliers in the same patient samples, or you're finding them in different patient samples. All right, so do they, they go together, or do they, you find them in uh, separate? In this case, you find them in separate cases. So if these are playing a role in cancer, they could be, you know, have different, um, they could be different drivers in the different uh, cancer samples, the different patient samples. But we don't know anything about it. All we know is that it's, it's highly expressed. All, right, all we know is that it's an expression outlier, and, and it's, it's uh, you know, it might have something to do with cancer. We don't know it's a fusion, right? We don't know if it was maybe just, uh, you know, something else happened. Um, you know, it could be a, a mutation in a promoter element or something that then just induced the expression of this thing. Uh, it could be some other chromatin remodeling things that happened and, and caused the expression to go way up. You really don't know. But, um, you know, because this is prostate cancer, they figure that, um, you know, might have had something to do with the fusions because maybe we know a little bit more about, we know about prostate cancer. Um, and we suspect that fusions might be involved. Um, there's some techniques, some molecular techniques. There's a technique called RACE, rapid amplification of cDNAns. Where if you have if you have part of a transcript, you basically you can basically piece, it's a fancy PCR it's a fancy RT PCR method to get the full length transcript if you just know like a little piece of it. So if we know what the ETV1 gene is, or we know what the ERG is, we can we can fish out that full length transcript that encodes ETV1 and see what else is attached to it. Okay, and they did that, and what do they find? They find Tempris2. All right, they find Tempris2 at the five prime end. Um, and that's, that's one of the ways they, they discovered these uh, Tempest 2 ERG and Tempest 2 uh, ETV1 uh, fusion transcripts in prostate cancer. We can do it other ways, right? We can do it more, more direct ways, right? Doing microarrays and, or just doing gene expression and, and having to do race or some other technique to, to find the fusion transcripts. It's a lot of work. Um, instead, maybe we just do whole genome sequencing, sequence everything, and then see, do we, do we find evidence for fusions when we assemble the reads? Right, or we just take the reads and, and align the reads to the genome and see, okay, is there evidence for, um, for, for breakpoints uh, that suggest fusion events? And that's highly effective. It's, really, it's a great way to do it. Uh, but you know, even though they keep saying you know, sequencing is, is almost free, you know, and sequencing keeps getting cheaper and cheaper, it's still not exactly free, right? It's still, you're still talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. And if you want to do a whole genome sequencing, you know, uh, it, it's still, it's, it's, uh, it can be expensive. You might, it might cost you a grand, but it's a grand per sample. And, um, you know, it'll get cheaper. And we'll, we'll see more and more of it in the future. But still, I mean, even, even today, it's still, it's, it's not like it's, it's, it's free. Um, and there are other methods that are cheaper, right? So that's the other thing, cheaper and, uh, and highly effective. And we'll talk about those too. So just an example here of a study that was done in 2011. They did the whole genome sequencing, and, um, and they discovered an important fusion in, um, in colorectal cancer. This will, if you do genome sequencing, it's, uh, you know, it's going to give you evidence about where fusion events might occur. Um, if you have lots of genome instability, like you do in some of these cases, like this case here, you can see this is a circos plot, and you, you have all the different rearrangements shown. Um, like in, interchromosomal arrange, rearrangements, and you have intrachromosomal rearrangements, these little green ticks. Lots, lots going on in this one cancer sample, right? Lots of uh, genome instability uh, in this one cancer sample. You see tons of rearrangements. And then there's another sample up here where you see, like, there's hardly anything going on. There's just a few little things going on, all right? Well, if you do whole genome sequencing, you're going to find all these events, all right? But some might be important. Some might be relevant to cancer. They might be the like the initiator or the driving event. Others could be just you know just random or, or uh, uh, passenger mutations, or right? um, they aren't necessarily selected for in any way. They just happen to um, just be there, just just an event that happened. Um, so being able to, to differentiate between driver variants and and passenger sort of neutral events. Is, is something that's of great interest. You're not really going to get a lot of that information from 
doing genome sequencing, right? You get breakpoint information, but it's not going to tell you exactly like this is the this is the underlying biology that's that's driving it. Why? Because it's not going to give you any expression information. If there's a fusion transcript, you're not going to know what that fusion transcript is, right? All you're going to know is that there's uh, some rearrangements that have been happening at the the larger genomic scale. However, if we do RNA sequencing, um, in addition to genome sequencing, or just do RNA sequencing alone. Um, it's cheap, especially compared to doing genome sequencing, right? Why is it cheap? Well, because the, you know, if you're looking at just like the, you know, the coding part of the genome, it's just a couple percent of the genome size, or like two or three percent of the genome size. Uh, so with the, the targets that you're sequencing are, is a small fraction of the total genomic material that's available. Uh, but it's, so it's cheaper, you get expression information, so it's just one of those multifaceted data types where you're not only getting sequence information, but you're getting expression information. And, um, and if there is a fusion transcript that is driving tumor genesis, we can actually capture that fusion transcript in our RNA-seq, right? And we'll know that it's there, and um, it's, it's better at sort of pinpointing, you know, what could be driving the, uh, the tumor in this case. But it's not as comprehensive as genome sequencing, right? So we're sort of relying on uh, that if that fusion is driving cancer, we're sort of relying on the fact that it, it's got to be expressed and hopefully at reasonable levels where we can detect it. Um, there could be other rearrangements that are happening that are relevant to cancer, but if there's no expression information, then we're, we're not going to see it. We would need genome sequencing in order to be able to see it. And there's tons of, uh, of fusions that have been detected in this manner. This is just one, one example, one of the earlier studies in 2011. Uh, where they detected a whole bunch of um, mast and notch fusions in breast cancer. So there's been a massive increase in fusion discovery over the years, and a lot, and this has been driven mostly by the, the technology improvements. You can see where, see so basically I have two, two kinds of fusions that have been uh, categorized here. You have the, the, the guided, all right, so this is based on cytogenetics. All right, it's so looking at karyotypes or um, or targeted approaches. You know, where you do something like race in order to pull them out, or using you know, using fish to find them. And you have oops, then you have unbiased approaches, uh, which would involve sequencing. So doing genome sequencing, doing RNA sequencing. And um, you can see um, right around when next generation sequencing came available, which is around 2008 you start seeing a, a huge increase, a rapid increase in the number of fusions that, um, that folks have been detecting in, in different cancer tissues. And um, current estimate is, is over 20,000, okay? But it, it depends on where you get your estimate. I mean, it could be 30,000, could be 40,000. This, uh, this is one of the things that we'll, we'll get into. So how is RNA-seq data generated? Just a basic overview. Um, you'd start with your total RNA, uh, which is going to have like 95% ribosomal RNA. All right, so you got lots of uh, most of the RNA when you isolate from the cell is actually not the stuff that you're you're probably going to be interested in. Uh, so what we'll typically do is uh, find a way to de deplete all of that ribosomal RNA. If we're interested in protein coding genes, uh, which is what most of us are, are interested in. Uh, we could do something like poly A capture, or just basically grab onto the poly A tail of, of transcripts, and that way we can get rid of all the ribosomal RNA and lots of other non coding RNAs because they tend to, the ribosomal RNA is not polyadenylated, and a lot of non coding RNAs are also not polyadenylated. So just by grabbing onto the poly A tail, you can just capture uh, those, those, um, those protein coding transcripts for the most part. There are some non coding transcripts too that have, are polyadenylated, but primarily we're, we're grabbing the um, the coding transcripts. So then we'll uh, turn them into cDNA through reverse transcription, uh, fragment them using either enzymatic or some mechanical method, and then grab um, grab the sizes that we can we can easily sequence with Illumina. We're looking at maybe yeah 300 base fragments on average, and then um, and when you do the sequencing, you've got choices here as far as you know how long are the reads that you want to sequence. You know, do you want to do really short read sequencing, like 25 bases, or do you want to do longer reads, 100, 150 bases? Uh, do you want to do single end, or do you want to do paired end sequencing? Uh, typically for fusions, I mean, that, that you're going to be better off with longer reads, 
all right? Because uh, read mapping is, uh, is one of the complexities, especially if you're trying to do read mapping around um, breakpoints in cancer. All right, so longer reads is going to be important. Um, anywhere from like 75 to 150 base reads. Longer the reads, the better, typically. And then doing paradense sequencing is important, too. Because with paradense, you can actually uh, you get reads that will, will span. Uh, like the, the, the read sequence itself will span the breakpoint. And you have cases where the paradense reads themselves will, um, will uh, straddle the, the breakpoint. Right, we're going to use both of those kinds of evidence. And I'll, I'll show you examples of that, too. So if we have a fusion gene, and we have, um, so in this case, we've got chromosome A and chromosome B that came together to form a, a fusion transcript. Uh, we have exons of the gene X and exons of gene Y. If we do RNA-seq on that, we're going to end up with um, lots of RNA-seq reads, and these reads are going to have, they're going to encode uh, the sequence around the evidence for the fusion. All right, so here's cases where we have these four reads. You know, in this case here, we have a read that, that the fragment was derived completely from, um, from gene X, the green gene. Right, so there's no evidence of a fusion in this read. And down here, we've got a read that this fragment, it's not a read, it's actually paired reads. Right? So you can get reads from each end, so these are, these are pairs. Uh, this fragment came from uh, gene Y, and there's, there's no evidence of there being any, any fusion in that read. Right? But these two reads here in the middle, uh, this read, or this fragment, I keep getting saying reads and fragments, this is a fragment. The left read here comes from the green gene, right? And the right, the right read from this paired end mate. Uh, comes from the from gene Y, right? So here we have evidence that you know, this, there might be a fusion event here, right? Just from this one read alone, we have evidence that there could be a, a fusion. And um, this would be called the uh, this would be a spanning read, okay? Because um, the read itself does not actually cross the breakpoint. You basically just have one fragment end aligning over on one side, and you have the other fragment end. Uh, end uh, aligning the other side, and it's just it's straddling the uh, the breakpoint. All right, so that that's our spanning read category. And then we have split reads. Here we have a we have a, a fragment where the the right read the right read of this fragment comes entirely from gene Y, but the left read part of that read aligns to gene X, and another little piece of that read aligns to gene Y. All right, so this is going to go in our split read category. Okay, so it's not straddling the breakpoint; it actually it actually crosses the breakpoint. Right, so this, this is this is important because this actually gives us evidence. So when we align this read back, and we see that this okay, this green part of the read aligns over here, and the red part aligns over here. This is basically telling us with single nucleotide precision, you know, where the the breakpoint in the transcript is. Okay, and that's why that's important. And the goal for a lot of the bioinformatics tools and, and operating on these data is to take these reads and from these reads be able to infer what's the fusion transcript that these reads came from. All right, and based on, on finding these, these fusion transcripts, infer what's the gene, what's the breakage that happened maybe at the chromosome level, okay? That could have res, re, uh, resulted in, uh, in this fusion transcript being generated. These are really the, the key goals here. And there's been lots of uh, lots of developments in bioinformatics tools over the last uh, you know ten years now um, to tackle this problem. It's been a very very competitive area. And there's a couple of key strategies that have been used. One strategy is um, starting from the the RNA seq reads themselves. One of the first things we can do is we can we can align the reads directly to the genome. And we can look for these different flavors of reads, right? We can look for those reads that we have uh, standing fragments are aligning discordantly to the genome, such that one fragment aligns to one chromosome, and the other read of that fragment aligns to another chromosome or another gene on the same chromosome, but in a very, very like distant part or in a different orientation or something that's just, it's not concordant, right? It's, it's discordant. Um, suggesting that there's something, you know, something wrong here, something unexpected, and could be that there's a fusion. 
And we also look for the other flavor, which is the, the split reads. I call them junction reads. Um, you find lots of different names for these things. Uh, split read is probably the, the better term. Um, but here you've got, you know, you've got the one read from the fragment where part of the read aligns here, and the other part aligns over here. And this is telling us that, okay, this breakpoint must be at this exon with this exon. All right, so that's, that would be the breakpoint at the, at the transcript level. So the spanning reads, they're really good for just saying that, you know, there could be a fusion event somewhere in this fuzzy area, right? Uh, but the split reads are giving you, again, the, the, the breakpoint precision, the transcript breakpoint precision, which is needed. Uh, the alternative approach that some have taken is to take, take all your RNA-seq reads and in a genome-free way do a de novo transcriptome assembly. So just reconstruct all the transcripts straight from the reads, not using the genome. And then once you have your reconstructed transcripts, then align those transcripts to the genome and see, do they align uh, as you'd expect or do they align in a chimeric kind of way? All right, and if you have this case where you have this nice transcript you've assembled, you know, it could be you know, 2 KB or 3 KB long, uh, but half of it aligns to one chromosome, the other half aligns to another chromosome, uh, that would be uh, suggestive of, uh, of there being a fusion event. But you have to do this sort of in a very careful way because it's very easy to get lots of artifacts when you do de novo transcriptome assembly and uh, you can end up with lots of chimeric transcripts and not every chimeric transcript is really going to be indicative of a fusion transcript. Um, but this is, this is uh, with some more careful analysis, you can, you can be somewhat effective in doing it this way. When you have your reads and you want to align them to the genome, you have, you have choices available to you. You can align just to the genome, you can align just to the transcriptome, and, uh, and there are different challenges. In this case, um, here you have uh, your chimeric read, and you can align this uh, to the genome, and you'll see that you'll have you know, part of the reads aligned here and here. Uh, or instead of aligning to the genome, we can just take the we create a database that has the reference transcripts in it, all right? And instead of searching the genome, we just search, we just search the transcriptome. And uh, it's a lot easier, right? You don't have to worry about introns. All right, and in this case, you're gonna see, okay, well, you get you know, part of it aligns to this and part of it aligns over to gene Y. Uh, but you don't have to worry about the splicing, right? You're just making the assumption that you, you know about all your targets and, uh, and you just wanna quickly identify those that are, um, that are split reads. One quick point to make here is that um, even if you, if, you, if you have your spanning fragments uh, and they don't, they don't have um, split reads, you're not going to know exactly where the, the junction is, or you're not going to know where the breakpoint is. Um, and another, sort of as an aside, um, even if you do have a split read and it's telling you at the transcript level this is where the breakpoint is, it's not telling you much about where the actual physical breakpoint is in the chromosome. Right, because in the chromosome it could be, you know, between certain introns. There's lots of places that could be. You could have the breakpoint at the chromosome level, all right? Because at, at the transcript level, we're really just looking at the, um, you know, what happens after splicing. Uh, the choice of the reference that you use, where they use uh, the transcriptome only, or if you use uh, some combination of the transcriptome and the genome, it's going to uh, it's going to impact. Um, uh, the um, how many reads actually align, and uh, also the accuracy of the read alignments too. So this is just uh, work um, to demonstrate that if you here if you have all those RNA seq data sets from different tissues, and you align them to uh, to different targets um, for the transcriptome only, so you have these different reference databases like Ensemble or UCSC or RefGene, you have these these uh, you know these, these special reference. Um, uh, transcript sets, uh, you know, no one can agree on exactly what the proper reference sh set should be, so everyone has their own, right? And some are more comprehensive than others. Like Ensemble has, has many more transcripts than, um, uh, than, than UCSC, and because of that, you'll end up having higher mapping rates of your reads um, to that data set than you might to, you know, rough gene or UCSC. Uh, but if you include the transcriptome and the genome, and you look at, at your, your percent of reads that got mapped, you know, you'll see that you have a much higher mapping, right? And in large, large, this is because 
Um, there's a lot of reads that correspond to transcripts that are just not included within your reference transcript set. Okay, and because the reference transcripts are just, it's just not going to be as comprehensive as maybe um, you'd like or hope. Um, so you get much more information if you if you search a combination of, of the transcriptome and the genome. And there's going to be other limitations too. So we really just, this, it's not just two choices. There's actually there's three choices here. You can search the genome alone. You can search the transcriptome alone. Uh, or you could search uh, some combination of the transcriptome and the genome. And there, there's going to be different reasons for why you'd want to do this. Um, in the case of, of genome only, the, this, the challenge here is, is mapping these reads, especially short reads. Because right? when you're mapping short reads to the genome, you have to take introns into account. Um, you can take into account known introns from your reference annotations, but there could be other, other splicing events that are not that are novel splicing events that are not included in those reference annotation sets. And those are going to be harder to identify based on the short reads. So read mapping to the genome is, is, uh, is, is more challenging than aligning directly to the transcriptome. But in the case, if you're, if you're searching just the transcriptome only, you're going to have other issues you're going to deal with. All right? um, mismapping is, is one of the issues. Because you have reads that, you know, if you, if you search that read against the transcriptome only, it might find an alignment, right? But it might not be the best alignment. If you had searched the genome, it might have put it somewhere else, all right? And the only reason it's giving you that alignment in the transcriptome is because it's the best alignment it could get when it only had the transcriptome information to work from, all right? But if you, again, if you search the genome, it would end up in a different place, and it, it may have been derived from a different lo location. So read mismapping is, uh, is one of the uh, things you have to, to worry about. Uh, the other issue is that if you're searching transcriptome only, you're limited to uh, whatever you know, whatever state of that transcriptome is. All right, you're limited to that knowledge base. How comprehensive is that transcriptome set? Does it include every possible isoform that might exist within your your sample? All right. The answer is generally no. Uh, so it's usually best, you know, given a choice. Um, the most rigorous approach is to use some combination, right? So you have the genome with annotations, right? In addition to that, you have the transcriptome, and um, you can search them both together and have intelligent ways of, um, of capturing the alignments and identifying those, those reads that are aligning in ways they wouldn't expect and could be uh, suggestive, if not indicative, of a, a fusion event. Lots of tools. Like I said, this has been going on for uh, a number of years now, and, uh, and there are many, many tools that have been developed. Um, I threw my hat in the ring about a year and a half ago, maybe a couple years ago. Um, so we have our own tool for this, and, um, and you'll be hearing more about that. You'll actually be using the tools that we developed in the, the lab in another hour. So there's a, a paper from 2012 that listed uh, a number of tools, and that wasn't even all the tools that were available in 2012. This is probably like two or three times this, uh, but these are the ones that are sort of popular at the time, and uh, and you still can see you know more and more being developed all the time. Uh, the tool that that um, I am involved in, in developing along with um, Alex Dobin, who's at Cold Spring Harbor, not this campus, um, uh, but he's, he's he's nearby, uh, is, is Star Fusion. So Alex Dobin wrote a tool called Star to uh, align reads to the genome. It's very fast, it's very popular, and, um, and it generates lots of uh, useful information about, um, about the reads that are aligning in discordant ways. Uh, so I worked with him to develop this, this tool called Star Fusion, which um, will take that information, map it to the genes, and do various kinds of filters, and we'll talk about these different kinds of filters uh, for uh, trying to identify those, those fusions that are more, most likely to be, to be correct and uh, most relevant to cancer biology. But you'll see more. Like I said, this is this is a it's a very active area of research. Um, it's a it's a problem that's messier than I ever thought it would be, and uh, and we'll talk about all the reasons why. <laughs> when all else fails, all right. So this this, this kind of cracks me up because uh, this is a paper. It was uh, when was this published? It was not long ago. Um, I don't know the dates not on there. It's like 2011, 2012, I think. Uh, but so they used they, they had a fusion that they were they they knew it, it probably did exist they had evidence that it would exist, um, but then when they ran the different fusion finding tools that were available at the time to find it, 
it didn't turn up. Instead, like a whole bunch of others would turn up. You know, they still had tons of predictions, but not, not a single one of those predictions was the one that they expected to find, uh, which turned out to be the actual like, driving event in this cancer type. All right, so you can just imagine the, the frustration. Uh, but, but the thing that cracks me up is, um, you know, they, they, they basically they, they said, it, it, makes, it makes sense what they did. Um, if there's a fusion event, all right, then I should be able to detect that, that part of that read that supports that fusion event in my RNA-seq data. All right, so they basically just created this little sequence of the expected uh, sequence around that breakpoint, you know, and they, they took that and just basically did a, a string match, all right? They ran Unix grep, right? So this is just a standard grep command, right? You can grep any kind of text document. You basically say, you know, find, find this word in the text, right? And, uh, and that's what they did. They just, on the command line, like, grep, gave it this, like, 40 base pair sequence, and then gave it the fast Q files, all right, and voila, they found reads that supported their fusion event. All right, it's not a fusion finding tool. This is just basic, like you know, search. You know, in like a word document, you just do a search, and this is their their, their technique. Anyway, they got a plus one paper out of it, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and it's uh, it, it's it's hilarious, but at the same time, it's it's like super frustrating, right? Because it's like, okay, tools should be able to find this. Um, it turns out it, this is not an easy one to find anyway, All right? So, so this is not like a BCR ABLE or a Tempris ERG or some of the other ones that you see um, showing up all the time. Those are relatively easy to identify. If for whatever reason, and I don't remember the exact reason, I think it had to do with repeat structures, um, but this is actually this is a tricky one to, uh, to, to find. So, um, but it's nice that, you know, when all else fails, you, know, you can just uh, get back to the very basics. So again, normally you try and do this sort of unbiased, you don't know what you're That's right, that's right. How did they have a good idea of what their fusion problem was when they were deciding to do that? Yeah, so they had, um, I think they had some cytogenetic information going into this. So they knew like what chromosome locations were involved. And, um, and there had been some previous work to demonstrate that this kind of fusion had showed up in, in this kind of cancer before. Um, so, uh, so they sort of went into it with this, this you know, previous knowledge. And sort of expectations of what, what they should be finding. Um, yeah, so a couple years ago, um, I, I got involved in this, and um, and you mean you hear about all the different tools that we've been developing, um, and and, it, and it, again, there's there's like you know thirty some tools that are out there, and you know I had questions just like a lot of other people had questions, like how how well do these other tools work? You know, um, you know, how, where, you know, what, what's the merit of the tools that we're developing? You know, where are we actually adding value? You know, what are the key challenges here that haven't been met before? And um, and some of the challenges were there are a lot of tools that were out there, but um, one one of the big challenges is that they weren't very fast, right? I mean, there's some tools where you give it a, a cancer sample and it could crank for not hours but days, you know. And there are some cases where like it would go on for like over weeks, and um, yeah, there are other cases where you know it might run for for days and then just crash, right? Um, and that's that's uh, just there's just a lot of frustrating elements to this. You know, so they're slow. Um, they require you know, huge amounts of resources to get them set up and running. And, um, and the nice thing about uh, about Star uh, is that it's, it's super fast. Right? So that was one of the things we wanted to capitalize on. We wanted to have a tool that we could would not only be accurate but it would be very fast. Um, so we could get through you know, lots of samples in a short period of time. Um, so really, it's just those, those are the two key things that we're after, accuracy and speed. And uh, so one of the things that I did was um, I wanted to, to benchmark all the different tools that are out there. And uh, I came up with um, uh, some, some ways of benchmarking it. Um, we'd use uh, both simulated data and we also use genuine data. In the case of simulated data, um, I simulated uh, thousands of, of simulated fusions. Um, there were other benchmarking papers that have been published before this, and a lot of times they'll use just really small data sets, or they have, like the number of fusions that they're using for like their true positive set or the truth set is like, you know, maybe, you know, 20 or 30 or 40, right? And um, I, didn't, I didn't think that was enough, right? I want like, I want thousands of these things. I want to just, you know, see, um, you know, give, it, give it a lot to work on. So we did five replicates, uh, 2,500 simulated, simulated fusions. Um, and then 30 million paired end simulated reads. And then for the genuine data, one of the nice things about simulated data is that you know ahead of time what all the, the correct answers are. Right? When you're working with real data, you don't always know. Right? You'll know about some of the things that you, are going to be true fusions, 
But for every fusion that you predict, you're not going to know necessarily, you know, was it was it a true fusion or not. And you don't want to have to go and like PCR validate everything and, and see. That's uh, another thing people will do, but again, that's it's sort of expensive and it's been done in a lower throughput kind of way. So simulated data is nice, but simula at the same time, simulated data is not the end all because real data is very different than working with simulated data. Simulated data is just it's way way cleaner and it's way way easier to um, uh, to find fusions than it is with uh, with genuine data. For genuine data, we use 65 cancer cell lines, and, uh, and we took an approach where um, if at least uh, three or four, I forget the number, I think we did, we did three, four, five, um, tried different different ways of doing this. Um, if, if three, four, or five of uh, the 15 different tools that we're using, if they all agreed, then we'll decide that that's going to be the truth set, right? And then what's a false positive? It'd be all the stuff that the things are, that are identified uniquely. And then, um, so that's just uh, you know one way of coming up with uh, a way to benchmark these things with genuine data. And uh, you calculate uh, metrics like precision and recalls of precision. You know, looking at true positives and false positives, and with recall, you're looking at um, true positives and uh, and false negatives. And uh, you can do these uh, these plots that are kind of like rock plots, the receiver operating characteristic plots. Um, you can think of it as like plotting true positives and false positives. And you can do, you can compute the accuracy as the the area under the curve. So I mean it, it gets kind of complicated, but in, in short, you're basically just plotting out true positives and false positives, and then just taking the area under the curve as a, as your measure of accuracy. And we do that, and we found that um, of course, you know, I wouldn't be showing you this if uh, if we didn't do as well. <laughs> Go hide under a rock somewhere. Uh, but we did, you know, this is a simulated data with uh, with short reads and long reads. And um, it would do quite well compared to a lot of the other competition. And then, um, and then on, on the real data, um, we did really exceptionally well um, compared to a lot of the other ones. So we're quite happy with that. And you're going to have some time um, during the lab to, to experiment with uh, with star fusion. Um, and there are some other um, tools that I'll, I'll talk about. So, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, what's the what's the magic or the secret sauce, right? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a <laughs> fail safe. In the end, it runs gross. Just all the other like tools, they have small increases in precision, but yeah. start using just way better. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I mean, there's, there's a couple of key reasons for that. Um, one is is that the, the the star aligner has a lot built into it to find these these mismapped reads. It's really rigorous with its uh, maximum unique match mapping algorithm. Uh, so I think that a lot of this really comes from from Star just being as accurate as it is with its its, um, its read alignment strategy. But the second piece is, is how we do filtering. Okay, and we'll talk about the sources of false positives. But so we're not only we're sensitive at finding the events when there's good evidence for it because of the Star aligner. Uh, we have we have a, a number of uh, advanced filters that are baked into the system to try to decide. Now, what's a, a good fusion versus what's likely to be a, a false positive, and to weed those out. So it's really those are the two key pieces. Yeah, yeah. Another question. Yes. So for the 65 cancer cell lines, how do you know the two to Yeah. So in this case, uh, so what we did was uh, you take all the predictions. You, you imagine like making a giant Venn diagram of all the predictions from all the different methods. And you look at the overlaps, and if there's at least like three or four uh, programs that all agreed that yes, they all found the same fusion, we put that in a truth set, okay? And all the in all the cases where they each any program predicted something uniquely, we put that in the false positive set, okay? And then anything in between is just sort of ignored. So besides, you have your trues, you get your truth set, and you get your false positives. And then but when you have your truth and your false positive set. You have your positive and your negative set, then you can you can basically benchmark them. And we did that. We did that requiring at least like you know two overlaps or three overlaps. We did it at each each and presented the results at each of these different stages. So it's not like yeah, you know, we just did. If we used you know if we used overlap of four programs, then we do best. And if we do three, then we're not best. We we tried lots of different things to just show that the results were robust. So how was your overlap? Like the numbers, like. Like, because I did integrate and have so fused, and the overlap was Tiny, very right? small. Yeah, very yeah, small. yeah. So I was very puzzled, like, why 
there's no overlap. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, 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 it's so one of those really frustrating things. Yeah, so you're showing an, like percentage here, but... Like, well, this is AUC know, values. Yeah, so yes. Um, yeah, so when you do, so when you do this, uh -huh. so you can think of this, uh, when you're making this plot, basically every, every point on the plot is going to involve um, some number of true positives and some number of false positives, uh -huh. right? And, um, and you basically, you measure the accuracy of each program using some threshold of evidence, right? So you say, okay, at this data point, you have to have at least, say, like five reads that support the fusion, right? So you apply that criteria to each of the different programs and count up how many true you have, how many false you have, um, and do your decisional recall um, computation, right? And plot it out that way. But yeah, you're, when you're doing this, I mean, when you're doing this, this Venn diagram of how things overlap each other, um, you know, there's not, there's usually a lot of false positives, right? But the number of false positives you have is going to depend on your, your minimum evidence support, all right? So if you actually, if you require that you have at least, say, like, you know, five reads that support a fusion, then the agreement, the area of agreement usually starts to get bigger relative to the, all, you know, all the ones where they disagree, all right? The issue really has to do with those fusions that have the least support, the programs kind of go wild in those areas, and that's how you end up with these huge numbers of predictions. Um, just to give you an example, like Top Hat Fusion, there's been a lot of papers in the past that have really, um, they, they've showed like, okay, Top Hat Fusion, you know, is, is an awful tool because, or Camara Scan, that's another one, Camara Scan, I get thousands of predictions of fusions, all right, whereas if I ran Prada, I might get like 15 or 20, all right, so one tool is telling me there's 20 predictions, right, and another one is telling me there's 1,000, all right, yeah, but if, if you look at the evidence threshold, right, if you take Top Hat Fusion or you take Chimera Scan and you say, okay, well, I'm going to require at least like three or four or five reads supporting that fusion, well, then the, the number of predictions goes down drastically, very, very fast, right? You actually, you know, they're not so bad, right? But if, if, you, if you're running them at sort of like the maximum sensitivity, then you get these like huge lists of fusions and it makes it look like these programs are maybe not as good as they actually really are. So that's another key issue. So that's, that's when you're making these plots, you know, you're not taking you're just, uh, you know, you're taking all the results from running that program, but you're sort of, you're benchmarking them at, at different um, levels of support for the fusions. Like, have to have at least five fusion reads, or at least six, or seven, or ten. And each time you'll get a different, different accuracy level. And if you're curious, um, there's, there's lots more. This is, I'm just showing you like one figure here, or maybe two figures from our paper. But we have a paper in, um, in BioArchive um, that really walks through like how we did this work. And, um, and hopefully later this year we'll have another paper um, that's more comprehensive than this. Any other questions before we go on? No? OK. And do we do like a coffee break at some point, or do we just wait and do that between? What's that? 15 In fifteen minutes. Okay. No, no, no. I was just curious, like when. I want to see how much time I have left for. Okay, then forty-four. Okay, so ten o'clock is. Okay, and the lab starts at. Ten thirty. Okay. So I have fifteen minutes to wrap up this. Okay, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. Um, are these tools You're asking how these things are different from each other as far as the aligners? So these are fusion detections, but they work on the aligned bands, or they work on the top two Oh, oh. So, so the, the inputs to all of these are typically uh, FASTQ files, right? Um, but then they'll use some aligner or they'll use some collection of aligners. Some of these tools will use like three or four different alignment tools and, um, and then just like combine the results or they do it in like a hierarchical way. Like if they don't find something using this tool, then they sort of go to the next tool. Um, yeah, so there's uh, you know, lots of different choices as far like Top Hat Fusion uses the Top Hat alignment tool. Star Fusion uses the Star Aligner. Um, there are others that have used like Bowtie. Um, and, uh, and some others, Soap Fuse uses Soap under the so each, each you know, there's an alignment tool. Someone's got a fusion thing that they slap on it to and called it something fusion. Right? That's how it works. Okay, so uh, okay, so I gotta I gotta move a little faster here for just 15 minutes. 
All right, so sources of false positives. Uh, we, have, we have technical artifacts, and we have biological artifacts. Uh, for technical artifacts, uh, there are alignment artifacts. Um, you, can, you know, if you have homologous genes, then it's very easy to have reads sort of mismap or, or show up as like split read alignments between, uh, between related genes. Um, if you have uh, genes that are highly expressed, you know, they'll have, um, they're more apt to have reads that have errors in them, right? And when you have, if you have reads that have errors in them, it's very easy to map them to the wrong places in the genome, right? Because of, because of those errors, they'll end up mapping better somewhere else or providing you with evidence for fusion when it really, the fusion doesn't exist. Uh, you have uh, reverse transcriptase template switching. A lot of these, these tools where we're generating our RNA-seq and we're doing our next-gen sequencing, these are steps that involve um, you know, reverse transcriptase and, and making our A to C DNA. But there's also other PCR-based steps, right? And because you're doing PCR, you can end up with um, uh, mis mispriming in the different PCR steps. And, and if you have mispriming going on, uh, that can make it look like you have a fusion when you, you really don't. It's just a, it's a sequencing art. It's a sequencing artifact or a library construction artifact. Um, as far as, as biological artifacts go, you know, there's this, you know, of course, natural genetic variation, and that's not all encapsulated within the reference genome sequence. Uh, they're trying to make it so that you can, you can do effective searches on the human genome, taking into account all the different variation that exists, but it's, it's a complex problem. Most of us right now will just download a single FASTA file and, uh, and run our tools given that single reference. Well, we know that's just, you know, that's just one model, and there's lots of variation in, in the human, um, human population. And, uh, and because of that, we're taking a sample from one person that doesn't necessarily match exactly to the reference. Um, and because there is just natural copy number variation and uh, other kinds of, of uh, variations that exist. Um, other hypervariable regions, like the um, MHC region, HLA, uh, you end up with lots of, of reads that are sort of mismapping and, and showing up as fusions with... Uh, with HLA, and uh, and most of the time those those are just uh, those are false positives. And then we have um, you have transcription induced chimeras, um, which the problem here is that it could be actually cancer related, uh, but it might not be. Uh, you just have you have lots of genes that are just they're close together on the genome, and you'll find that they, they they form these fusion transcripts, and it's just because you know just how transcription occurs uh, sometimes. It's just natural, right? But some, sometimes there's a small deletion or something on the genome, and that forms these fusion transcripts between neighboring genes that wouldn't normally exist. And, and, uh, and there's evidence that some of these could actually um, be uh, driving cancer. So, so you have to be careful. It's a, it's a double-edged sword. Then we have transplacing. You can have actual fusion transcripts being generated that don't involve any rearrangement at the, the DNA level, right? You just just the splicing machinery. Sometimes it makes mistakes. Sometimes it's actually intentional. So there are transplaced products that are actually important for biology, or supposedly supposedly important for biology. That's what the papers tell us. Um, I have uh, reservations about some of these things. Um, so how do we mitigate the, the different artifacts that show up? Um, we can, in a, in a bioinformatic way, and this is one of the things that we do with Star Fusion. We have all these different screens. Um, you can take into account repeats in the genome. Uh, you can have uh, lists of, of what are called red herrings. These are gene lists. These are lists of fusions that, if you see them, maybe you should just ignore them because they're not they're not meaningful. And I'll, I'll say more about that. Um, for read-throughs, uh, you could just have a minimum distance threshold. So if, if you have a fusion between two genes and those genes are pretty close on the genome and they're in the same orientation, you know, maybe we'll just ignore them or put them in a separate pile. Um, consider the strength of the evidence, like we talked about earlier. You have different different uh, numbers of reads that are going to be supporting these fusion events. If you only have one or two reads supporting that fusion, you know maybe you're not going to trust it so much, right? As opposed to if you have you know 50 reads or 100 reads that are supporting that fusion event, or right? having one or two reads, eh, maybe maybe not. Um, you really have to think harder about that. As uh, we do know, the false positive rate does go up considerably with these tools when you have uh, very little support. Examine the transcript breakpoint. Do you have actual um, splicing going on at the breakpoint where the fusion transcript is? All right. A lot of times when you have fusion transcripts that are generated from uh, translocations, those translocations happen within introns. Okay. So when you find a fusion transcript, it's actually it's, it's natural, normal splicing that happens to generate that fusion transcript. It's just in a different genomic context. If you have a breakpoint at your fusion transcript and it's not canonical splicing, 
Yeah, it could be that you know the if it's a translocation. Maybe that translocation happened between exonic regions, right? And that's why the breakpoints not happening at splice size. But more often than not, it's because you have uh, an artifact, an artifact from uh, from mispriming or reverse transcription slippage or something else going on, and it's not real. Uh, but it's not always the case. You can do a supervised fusion analysis, right? If you know what you're looking for, you know, run grep. All right, we have, we have other ways to do that now too. So it's not just grep, but that's the general idea, right? If, if, you, if you have a list of fusions, you have like a panel that you're super interested in, and you wanna make sure you're gonna do the best job you can at finding those, um, you can do a supervised analysis. Uh, capture any evidence for these specific fusions. Uh, we, have a, we have a tool that's called Fusion Inspector that does that, and there are, there's other uh, breeds of tools that are being developed uh, to do the similar kinds of things. Uh, you, can, you can characterize the evidence, you can rescore the fusion, uh, look at the expression of the fusion versus the non-fused versions of those alleles. And we can look at the functional impact, we can better characterize that fusion. You know, does it, does it, is it an in-frame fusion event that could give us a fusion protein, or does it look like it's disrupting one or both of the genes? And also just facilitating the visualization of the data, make it easier for us to, to study the evidence that exists. So we have a tool called uh, Fusion Inspector we developed. Uh, you basically just give it the list of the fusions that you're interested in. Uh, in this case, those fusion predictions could come from other tools, like you could run you know, Star Fusion or Top Hat Fusion or you know whatever your favorite uh, fusion tool is. You get a list of candidates, give it to the tool, and uh, what that tool will do is it actually it'll create these mini fusion contigs where it takes those genes that are supposedly fused and it just puts them in the same orientation, so they look like you know. They're not fused, right? They look, they're, they're complete genes, but in the context of this genome, they're like normal relative to each other as compared to in the regular genome. And when you, uh, you can realign the reads to the whole genome, including these mini fusion contexts, and you can see, okay, are there reads that actually align better in, the, in this context of the mini fusion genes than in the whole genome? All right. So these are reads that would normally, in the, in the whole genome, align as being discordant. All right. But in the context of these mini fusion gene contexts, they're going to align as concordant. Okay. So this is a nice way to sort of recapture that evidence. The reads are going to align normally, but only in this, you know, better in this context than in the whole genome. And once we have that, then we can we can easier it makes it easier to, to visualize these things. We can use our, our Trinity software, which does de novo transcript reconstruction. To, uh, to reconstruct that fusion transcript and include that evidence as well. We can put that into IGV, and you're gonna actually do this later uh, during the lab. Uh, put it in IGV, and then in IGV, we can, we can look at any given mini fusion contig. In this case, we have BCR able. Again, it's our favorite. And, um, and here we have all the reads. They're aligning to this contig, and then we have the, the evidence for the fusion. We have the, the split reads, and we have the uh, spanning fragments. Uh, that show us where the breakpoint is in the context of the reference uh, gene structures. This is a really great way to be able to, to evaluate that. There are, there's another tool that, that is uh, it's, uh, under review. Uh, don't ask me how I know that. Um, it's also in BioArchive. Um, and it, uh, it does something very similar. So it can give you output that you can put in IGV. It works in, in the context of what are called super transcripts, which we're not going to cover. Um, but it's just a way of, of, of taking your transcript data and, and turning it into a genome, a genome-like situation, which makes it easier to uh, to view and interrogate the evidence. If you want to prioritize these fusions, there's a number of ways we can do that. Uh, again, you get these long lists sometimes, all right? And you got to figure out, okay, what are the what are the fusions that we're going to care about? Which are the ones that we're going to, be going to pursue? Um, we can look at the expression. Are there, is there an expression outlier here, which would suggest that that it could be playing a, an important functional role? Um, if we're doing a cancer study, is it is it found as being recurrent? All right, so do we see, see the same fusion pairs showing up time and time again uh, in different samples? You know, if we have a, a fusion that's a hallmark of a cancer type, it will find it in every single sample, and, and that is the case for some of these cancers. Uh, in some cases, we'll find that just one of the one of the pairs, one of the fusion pairs, is the same, all right, but its partner might be different. Okay, that that can also happen. Um, and do we have corroborating rearrangements? We have a case where it's a balanced rearrangement, or if we have uh, chromosome situations like this, you know, A, B, C, D, uh, we find a fusion between A and D. Well, if we find A and D, do we also find the, uh, the balanced rearrangement fusion as well, right? We find C and B together. 
Uh, and that would give us more you know, strong evidence that this is actually a fusion event. Uh, not only is it likely to be real, uh, but it's likely to involve a, a translocation like this, a balanced translocation like this at the genome level. Um, look at the function of the genes. Have they, have they been previously implicated uh, to be involved in cancer? Like, do we find, do we find a, cancer, a known cancer gene? Um, do we find a kinase? If we find a kinase, that's important because we might be able to actually treat it with kinase inhibitors. Uh, so in the clinic, that, that would be an important thing to know. Is it in-frame fusion? Uh, and what's the evidence uh, supporting it in terms of the number of reads, additional data from DNA? And um, we have, um, so these, these, these are fusions that tend to show up time and time again in these different fusion contexts and different cancers, certain transcription factors like the ETS family transcription factors. And um, if you don't find the same pair over and over again, a lot of times you'll find like one of these. There are, are some um, very large scale studies that have been performed. And uh, this has really been the goal with some of these large cancer projects is to, to characterize what are all the, the genetic variations that are, are relevant to cancer. So we have, you know, we have dozens of different cancer types and you have uh, hundreds if not thousands of samples for each of these cancer types and characterizing them at different levels, the DNA level, at the RNA level, epigenetics, basically doing everything. And um, it's, there's, there's lots of different papers that are coming out showcasing uh, findings at the, the pan-cancer level. There's another big paper that's going to be coming out later this year probably for the pan-cancer analysis um, that goes beyond this, this earlier TCGA study. Uh, but this has been hugely useful because for each cancer type, we can look and see what are the different fusions that are characteristic of that cancer type. Are we seeing the same fusion showing up over and over again? Uh, or is the cancer type specific? We can look at the partners that are involved. Um, some, some cancer types are, have, have a lot of fusions. Other cancer types have, have low fusions. We can correlate the number of fusions that we have with is it genomic instability or is it balanced rearrangements that are going on here. So there's a lot of really interesting things that are going on here. And this is just, uh, these are different cancer types. So thyroid cancer, uh, bladder cancer, uh, percent of samples actually have that, have a fusion or any fusion. And you can see most bladder cancer samples have a fusion. Uh, very few thyroid cancers do. Uh, this is just each, each sample is being plotted here, the number of fusions that it has. Um, this is just showing a uh, measure of genome instability. So we can see in ovarian cancer, there's lots of genome instability. Um, bladder cancer, we also have significant, but thyroid cancer is actually very quiet. So it's a quiet type, has very few fusions. You can look at copy number variation. Is copy number variation involved in, in these fusions? And a lot of times when you have fusion events, you also see copy number variation nearby that's associated with it. Uh, but there are cases like in AML where these balance translocations and, and do not involve copy number variation. So a lot of interesting things going on there. Uh, we're building up these huge databases of fusions. Uh, so we have a chimer DB where we're collecting fusions. This is not my work. Um, they are collecting uh, information about fusions. Um, they have expert uh, curators. They're collecting these things. They have counts here of the number of fusions they have in their databases. So there's a thousand that have been curated. Um, scraping PubMed, uh, they have about 3,000. And then if you're just looking at all the predicted ones coming from running these different prediction tools in these large scale studies, they say now it's 30,000 gene pairs. All right. My guess is that a lot of these are not relevant. A lot of them are probably passengers or they're false positives or they're artifacts. I'm sure this is a lot of junk that's in here. Uh, but but the, the knowledge base is going to be high quality and the Chimer Pub is going to be a high quality. So these are two really great data sets. And this is also is useful, but you know, the more sequencing data we have, the more samples we have, this is continue to grow like everything else at a very high rate. Uh, some earlier studies had looked at uh, relationships among the different fusion partners. And this is, this is not using NGS data. This is actually using the uh, cytogenetic data and earlier experimental kinds of data. And you find that, um, you know, there are some genes that are promiscuous. But this is kind of biased because they're doing race and they have very specific targets they're looking at. So there's a lot of over-connectivity over in here um, due to the, that kind of bias. Uh, with more modern approaches and look, doing um, next generation sequencing approaches, you don't find these, these huge, you know, connections. If you look at these specific cancer types and the fusions that are being found, uh, you find that they're more loosely connected. You still find hubs. You still find genes that... Um, that are, you know, they truly uh, little hubs here where you find this gene over and over again fused with other things uh, relevant to cancer. Uh, but you find, like in ovarian cancer, I mean, something like 97 or 98% of, of the fusions that you find do not form these, these big, vast networks. 
And they're also, these are all predicted from doing like RNA-seq kinds of studies, right? So it's not, it's not like they're all developed and characterized and shown to be relevant to uh, cancer biology. Uh, so, you know, are they passengers? Are they drivers? Are they artifacts? You know, this is one of the things that, that a lot of us are really focused on right now to try to clean this stuff up and figure out what's important and what's not important. Um, other databases, you can sort of, you can just go and you can, um, you can surf or you can scrape or you can download. Uh, you got to be careful in some cases because in some cases they want, they have commercial licensing and, and other kinds of uh, criteria. Um, so you got to be careful. It makes it hard for, when you have commercial licensing for people like me to develop tools that are built around these kinds of databases because um, some, uh, I like, I'm a free software kind of guy, an open data kind of guy. And um, I try to keep the barriers to tool use and, and accessibility as low as possible. And when you have to sign a license to do anything, it, it really gets in the way. Um, we have a tool called Fusion Annotator, where um, I've basically gone and I've scraped what I could from the stuff that is, is, is freely accessible. And um, if you have a Fusion pair, you can basically just run it through my Fusion Annotator, and it will tell you, you know, it's shown up in these different databases. Uh, it'll tell you whether it's, it's been previously shown to be relevant to cancer biology. Uh, those kinds of things, and I find that's been uh, a really helpful tool. And this is incorporated in our tools and the reports. Um, just a few more slides, and um, then we'll finish up. Uh, other hints at, um, at what are what are fusions that are likely to be real and not artifacts. You can look at expression data. Uh, this is an example where you have um, you have expression profile along the genome for for this gene, and it ends abruptly. It's truncated, right? So it ends. The expression evidence ends long before you'd expect it to end, right? You expect it to end down here at the transcription of stop site, but it doesn't. And then it's going over here. Uh, it starts much earlier than, than you'd kind of expect it. You expect it to start over here, but it starts over here. Yeah, so if you have if you have expression evidence along with other evidence for this fusion, that's that's also helpful to convince yourself that it's uh, it's not an artifact. Um, there's uh, some metrics that I'm, I'm including in some of our software to try to address. Um, the evidence for a fusion versus the evidence against the fusion uh, to help us to try to, um, to prioritize some of these things. I'm not going to get enough time to get into this right now, but, um, but this, is, this is one of the metrics that we're going to be looking at. Um, reading frame pre preservation is, is key. Are we making a fusion protein or are we not making a fusion protein? All right, if we're making a fusion protein, that has different ramifications than if we're not making one. So, um, so we can look at that. We can see, given the fusion event between these transcripts, are we breaking a codon? Are we shifting the reading frame? Um, those are all things that we can look at. And we have tools for that, too. We have uh, this examine coding effect functionality, which you'll run later. And that will tell you, yes, the, the, this fusion here, BCR able. It's in frame. Here's the fusion protein sequence. Here's the domains that we find in the combined protein sequence. We can give you all that information. Uh, beware of red herrings. These are the ones that are likely to be false positives. Um, we need to be careful here, though. You know, what, there's, there's lots of, of fusions that can occur naturally or might just show up as, uh, like, regular kinds of artifacts that you might not want to trust. So we can look at GTEx, which is an a, a RNA-seq project for normal tissues, and we can see what kind of fusions do we find if we look at normal tissues. All right, and if, if we see those showing up time and time again, and we see it in our cancer data sets, then maybe we're going to discard it or maybe put it in a separate pile. Because um, if we're seeing it in normal tissues, then it's probably not relevant to, to cancer. Got to be careful, though, um, and I'll, I'll have something to say about that. But anyway, there's just these different databases of, of basically normal variation that you might expect to see, and we can take that into account when we're doing filtering. Um, there are caveats to this. You know, if you run fusion predictors and you, you run it on GTEx, you might find it. There's, there's a few samples in, um, in uh, GTEx that have BCR able showing up. But wait a minute, these aren't leukemia patients. These are, these are normal people. They die of natural causes. All right, and so why, why might that be? I mean, it could be a false positive. It could be someone that, that was starting to come down with leukemia but didn't present any symptoms yet, right? Um, you know, constantly people are carriers for things, right? And it's not until later in life where they kick in and actually start causing disease. So you gotta be careful about some of these things. Um, and then you have other cases too, like this is a really confusing one. Yeah, here's here is this, uh, this fusion uh, Jazz F1, Jazz 1, or Seuss, I don't know what it is. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a weird one because it, it's, a, it's one that shows up, um, what do I have it? It shows up uh, very early in development, okay, and it results from transplacing, and it's apparently important for biology, 
all right, that you have this transplace part. And this is another one where I'm just, you know, it's, it's too kind of weird and too science fiction-y for me to fully believe this stuff, but uh, it, it could very well be real. They show evidence. It's a science paper from 2008, but it's just, it's just one of those things that kind of, it just strikes you as being just like crazy bizarre. Um, and if it's real, then it's just, it's a crazy bizarre real thing that happens. Uh, but it's, it's transplacing, right? But if you find this as an actual fusion, so it doesn't involve translocations or anything, right? It's just a normal transplace product that is apparently important for biology. Um, the other issue is you can't trust like half of things that are published these days anyway. Know that too, right? So that's another thing that kind of goes into my thought process with a lot of these. Um, <laughs> um, except for all my papers. You can trust all my papers, right? Um, <clears throat> but if you, you know, they show that this is relevant to cancer. If you actually have a translocation that generates this fusion product, um, it can be re relevant to cancer. So, uh, you know, so if you, not every time you see it is a cancer related, and it's just, it's very weird. Um, there's another one is just, I have to tell you about, that is also very weird. Um, and uh, it's called, so it's, it's Cancel ARL17A. You see it all over the place. You'll find it in all different cell lines. You'll find it in, in, in cancer samples. You'll find it in normal samples. It just, it's, a, it's a natural variant. 30% of people with European ancestry have this as a natural fusion. All right? and it just shows up. And, um, and this paper is saying it's statistically enriched in glioma samples. Glioma is a brain cancer. Okay? Uh, which could be, you know, this would be a big deal. Honestly, well, why isn't this a science paper? Why isn't this a nature paper? You know, that's, that's one of the first things that comes up. And so you look at the, you know, I'm going to pick on this paper a little bit. Um, so they have this figure here, and, and um, in this figure, it's supposed to be glioma, not total. So I, I X that out, put glioma there. And they have the number of, 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 um, of patient samples um, that have the fusion, um, and the number of patient samples um, that, um, yeah, number of patient, normal samples that have the fusion, number that, that are or brain cancer that have the fusion. You see the percentages of the back, 52% versus 12%. Right, and the numbers there on the or the numbers of samples that they had. And, and they're saying because of this, because you have 52% in glioma and you have 12% in normal to have this fusion that, um, you know, it's, it's statistically enriched for this, all right? And, and yeah, if you, if you run, you know, there's a little R code for you. If you run a little Fisher's exact test on this, um, you get a p-value of 0.02. In the paper, they say it's less than 0.01, but uh, maybe they did a one-sided test or something. I don't know. Um, I'm doing a two-sided test. It's 0.02, right? So this is statistically significant. So the first thing I'm thinking of, okay, this is why it's not a nature paper, and I'm not sure I believe this. And then, um, well, you have to ask yourself a question too. Well, what if it, you know, basically in normal, in normal samples that don't have glioma, you have there's two that have the fusion, right? At a 17 total, right? So two have the fusion, 15 don't. What if we had three, right? Maybe instead of two, we had three, right? Well, if you do that, you use stats on it. P-value is 0.06. Right, so now all of a sudden you're not you're not statistically significant. So I, I, I just get one of those things where it's like, let's let's get some more samples. Let's look at this a little bit further. Um, if I'm you know I'm a, I'm a person that has European ancestry, obviously. If, if I'm one of those people that has you know I have a thirty percent chance of having this fusion, I'm not going to be super worried about having a en enriched uh, probability of coming down with, uh, with cancer because of this. Uh, last uh, one of the last slides here. Uh, this is just to say that if, if you know if you want to do the most rigorous job you can. And, and fusion detection. Uh, RNA is great, again, because it's cheap, it's effective, you can get things that are biologically relevant because they're expressed, uh, but you really need the DNA data and uh, RNA-seq data in order to get the full picture. The DNA data, you can get, generate these breakpoint graphs uh, for complex arrangements that involve more than just putting two chromosome pieces together. You can have very, very complex rearrangements and having the DNA data is going to help you. Um, and also having the DNA data is not going to give you all the information because with the RNA data, you might see just the parts that are expressed and the parts that are spliced out. Um, so you'll have much more complex fusion events going on, and the RNA-seq data might be just giving you sort of the, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, but hopefully it's the biologically relevant tip of the iceberg in a lot of cases. Um, other considerations, um, you know, if you're going to do these kinds of studies, how many samples do you need? Uh, it can get expensive. You know, if our method costs a dollar per sample on, on, on the farm, um, then, and if I have 10,000 samples to run, I'm easily cranking up 10 grand worth of debt. And, uh, and I've done that. I, I spent 13 grand in two days running things on, on the cloud. Uh, so it really, it doesn't take much, uh, much effort to, to start racking up some costs. Um, thankfully it was my own 13 grand. Um, NCI has been good to me. Uh, fusion partners, are they known? Uh, so you can consider, if they're, if they're known, you can do things like uh, targeted capture. Um, so it's more of a supervised kind of analysis. How sensitive do you need to be? You know, how long do your reads need to be? How, how many reads do you need? 
Um, you know, these are all important things too, because there are samples that I'm running through right now that are supposed to have fusions in them, and I'm not finding them, and it's because they're so drowned out by all the other transcripts that I'm just not seeing them. But the, the company says that they're there, and this is one of the sort of ongoing battles I'm having. Um, experimental design considerations. Uh, it's good to validate predictions when you can. Um, you, get, you know, if you're don't just pick one favorite fusion finder and just run that. You know, you might like our Star Fusion software, but I'm not going to tell you just use Star Fusion. Yeah, use Star Fusion, use Fusion Catcher, use some of the other ones, Kim Pipe, some of the other ones that have demonstrated to be you know, highly effective. Because we're not going to capture everything. Uh, I know that, um, and I know that there's certain um, uh, dark areas that, that we're not very good at yet. This is, and it's constantly it's a moving target. Uh, to make these things better. Uh, this is what you're going to do during a lab later. We're going to take RNA-seq data. You're going to use Star Fusion to find uh, initial fusion predictions. We're going to run that through our fusion inspector software so you can um, uh, in, in, in silico validate those fusion predictions and uh, evaluate the evidence manually using IGV. And then we have our fusion annotator software and fusion coding effects software that will tell you about um, have you seen that fusion before in cancer and um, is it an in-frame or does it look like it's frame-shifted? So. Uh, that is it.